Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Astros Baseball. Joining me tonight, Astros legendary broadcaster, I believe for like 30 years, and Astros Hall of Famer, Bill Brown. Brownie, what's up, buddy? Just trying to stay warm, Rob, and that is a challenge in Texas. You know, for those <laughs> who grew up kind of in the Midwest, uh, we've been here so long in Texas, some of us, that we're thinking of ourselves as Southerners, and we don't like cold weather anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I grew up in Oklahoma, and we got snow every year, and we got ice, and I was telling my wife how we woke up for school, and we went and turned our cars on, and then we got ready, and then we yeah. came outside. That's right. That's right. So it's, I think I, I've lived in Texas like 30 something years already. And mm -hmm. even though I grew up that way, I'm not used to it. I'm not, I'm used to it being super hot. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. I like hoodie weather where it's just a little bit quiet. Well, it's, I mean, a little bit. It, you know, as, as you're aware, it's so disruptive uh, to the Southerner to be thinking about water pipe problems and things that, you know, are. Our workout facility shut down uh, because of that. And, you know, other things are shutting down because of uh, water problems and pipe problems and things of that nature. And we used to deal with this, as you say, routinely up north. <laughs> yeah. You grew up in uh, Missouri, right? Correct. Yeah. I, j I just, I've talked to you two or three times already. And this is the first time that I think I realized that. And that's because of your uh, book. But let's start off with this since it's it's happening right now. We got the NFL playoffs, and I mentioned to you before we started recording, and if anybody listening knows this, but they showed it on the game tonight that every team that scored first won all games. So if the Buccaneers who scored first hold on, then that'll be six out of six. Well, that's kind of crazy. Um, and I think you know it's the weather is is a huge factor, of course, in a game like Buffalo's game. Uh, and so now <laughs> Houston has to be a little concerned, I think, about the weather factor. But when you play in an indoor stadium, that is usually the case at this time of year. So speaking of the Texans, what do you think about the season? They, they finally got a really good quarterback. D'Amico Ryan's built a good – they already had a decent team. They just needed to fill in a few spots. They did great at the draft, and uh, it's pretty awesome that they won their first playoff game. Yeah, everybody's extremely excited here uh, because uh, they're just uh, not only playing well this year, but I think the future looks extremely bright right now. And after being in a dark hole for a few years, there is certainly hope for the future now. Yeah. So at the beginning of the season at work, these guys were talking about the Cowboys. And I chimed in. I said, I bet the Texans go further than the Cowboys do. And they looked at me like I was nuts. And of course... I'm not brave enough to put a wager on it, but I turned out to be right because the Cowboys got whooped. Yeah, I wouldn't have taken that wager, but um, yeah, <laughs> there, there's, you know, I mean, one of the uh, classic organizations in sports, you know, one of the most popular organizations in the history of sports is now in just completely disarray. And uh, it, it's very, very strange. Yeah. So let's go back to, I guess it was last year around August, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. this is so early in the year. Last year is not that yeah. far away. Right. But but you were um, inducted into the Astros Hall of Fame. Yes. Yes. And I wanted to go to that game, but I didn't. But anyway, you were there with uh, Terry Poole. You and Terry Poole got in? Uh, well, it was actually Billy Doran. Oh, yeah. Billy Doran. Yeah. Terry had been in the previous year with Tal Smith. Oh, Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I knew you went in with somebody that played in the 80s. I just got the name yeah. wrong. Well, so, it, it was very meaningful to go in Billy Doran. Uh, uh, my wife and I moved here in 87 to take the Astros job. And Billy was here. He was the starting second baseman, of course. But Terry Poole was also here. And Terry's a good friend of mine and lives here. But I hadn't seen Billy Doran in decades, ever since he was traded to Cincinnati uh, really, I don't think I saw him since about 1990. So it was great to be together with him again. When when you you speak about Cincinnati, I, I I can never get it off of my mind when I think about you. How the story that you told me about when you used to work there <laughs> and what happened. That's just it's so crazy that they can let you go and then you sort of this. Is, I'll give you a little catch up here. 
and you sort of like, okay, forget broadcasting. I'm going to do something else. And then you, you go to the Astros, you're there, you're there for 30 years. It's a crazy story. Uh, well, you're well aware of uh, how this business works and um, it, it's similar to players in sports. They jump from team to team, not necessarily wanting to sometimes, but it just takes a while sometimes to have the right fit. Uh, with the right team, the right management, and then sometimes that fit is no longer right and people move on. But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, if I talk to kids now and I don't do that too often, um, I just tell them that that's a part of what you're buying into. If you want to go into this business of being a sports broadcaster, uh, you're probably not going to work. But, you know, back in the days when I came out of college, people would work for IBM for their whole lives. And that whole thing blew up many, many decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> so um, speaking about moving team, moving players to move teams and all that, this is my opinion. I think college football is getting out of control for me as a OU fan because I grew up in Oklahoma. I think our whole entire offensive line – our quarterback, and I think a running back, they all hit the portal and they didn't play in the bowl game. So I think this portal, I guess it's good that they, they. I mean, the only thing positive for next year is that the 12-team playoff, because if you're not in the playoffs, nobody plays. No, nobody plays. Uh, <laughs> there's way too much player movement. Um I think most of my friends feel that should be limited to uh, one portal move per career, something like that. How's yeah. that? Yeah, they just move whenever they want. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. I, I was going to say that too. Like back in the day, they they could move once, but they lost a year. But just limit the movement. That I think that will help. It. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. All right. So you've written a couple of books already, but you have a new book out. Tell us a little bit about how you came up with uh, the idea to write this book. I wasn't going to write another book, Rob. And, uh, you know, I just got as a fan caught up in the pennant race with the American league West coming down to the final weekend with uh, the Astros and the Rangers and the Mariners. And I thought, wow, when's the last time this happened? And I really didn't have an answer to that question. But I did think I was racking my brain for the last time it might have happened, and, and it may have, uh, but what I came up with was 1964. And I was growing up in Missouri then, and I was a Cardinal fan, and it was the Cardinals, and it was the Phillies, and it was the Reds and, and the Giants. All those four teams could have won going into the final weekend. and. Wow. Just a crazy year. And then I uh, started uh, thinking about, well, I want to read a book or two about that year. And I started ordering books about 1964. <laughs> and then I just got totally immersed in what was happening, not only on the baseball field, but around the world in general that year. And it kind of reminded me of now, as a matter of fact. But <laughs> here we are almost 60 years from that time when the Cardinals won the World Series. And uh, I, I feel the story is still just one of the most fascinating in baseball history. Well, what happened that year? The Cardinals were your team growing up, huh? They were. They were. <clears throat> I was growing up in a town called Sedalia, and that was about 200 miles from St. Louis. And as you well know, back then, there weren't many games on television. So typically, baseball fans would listen to the radio most yeah. nights. That's the way we enjoyed the games. Yeah, when I was a kid, it was TBS. And WGN, if you wanted to watch teams, and normally that was a lot of people's favorite teams just because of the access to them. Exactly. Uh, because if you're a fan of baseball, you, you really want to watch it every day or listen to it. Yeah. Day. That's the best way to enjoy it, I think. So when you were broadcasting TV back then, you only did like 40 or 50 games, right? That's correct. Yeah. That's, that's Which, weird. Uh, sometimes it's, it's weird, but, you know, in the case of Cincinnati, and that was – one of the smallest major league markets, but one of the best teams. Uh, but the Reds, as, as so many teams were in those days, were extremely cautious about televising more games because they really thought it hurt their attendance to put games on TV. Hmm. I would think it would help. It let you fall in love with the guys. There's that argument also. And, and I think that was proven to be 
what they should have thought all along by the fact that then, then when cable came along and you know, all these games started being televised. It really did not hurt attendance at all. In fact, I think it did help it. So in this book, you're you're talking about 1964, the baseball's bizarre season. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're talking about like what's going on in the world. And you're talking about your family, like let's get in the car and we're going here and whatever. And, And then you're talking about what's going on in baseball. And I think it's kind of cool that you're following almost the whole season of what's going on in every facet of your life, you know, but what, what's crazy to me, like, you know, skimming through the book is how much stuff happened that year, (laughs) not even on the baseball field, but in the world. True. And that's why I decided to write about it. You know, Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Johnson took over from John F. Kennedy after the assassination and Johnson, had to run again in, in 64, you know, right away, a year after taking over uh, from Kennedy, he had to run again. And at one point he didn't even want to run. And there was all this stuff going on in the world. There was Vietnam and we had, um, you know, Russia and China were both kind of beating the drums for starting even more turbulence around the world. In addition to Vietnam, we had Cuba. So there were all kinds of world tensions and uh, there was social unrest in the United States on college campuses. Remind you of anything? (laughs) (laughs) It's coming back around. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And and I I remember in the seventies and eighties when I was going to school, is we would do that drill, you know, because everybody was so worried about being bombed by Russia. And we had those, the bombing drills where we got under the desk. And I think that was also a tornado drills. Mm-hmm. But, uh, it was kind of funny about that. Not funny, but yeah. just remembering I, things like I, that. I wrote about that too, because that, that remains uh, seared in my brain just as it is in yours. And that was part of life back then. But I know that there might be some people who would read this book who are just totally unaware of that. Yeah. It's a lot different than it is now. So was your, uh, was your dad a baseball fan also? He wasn't a big baseball fan. He was an attorney, a small town attorney. Um, you know, it, it wasn't like uh, the law shows, the legal shows today on TV or anything like that. Pretty mundane yeah. work most of the time, but uh, we had a very normal upbringing, but no, he, he followed sports generally, uh, but no, he wasn't really immersed in it. He wasn't a huge baseball fan. Were you closer to the Cardinals stadium or, 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 uh, Kansas city Royals? We were closer to Kansas city, but the the Kansas city A's were a terrible team. (laughs) Yeah. uh, They got no respect from, from any of us. We went to a few games, but, uh, yeah. Honestly, it was uh, it was like going to a minor league game. I saw that part in the book, um, and it just blows my mind that 1964, they had a team and they didn't spend money, and they still don't spend money, and now they're moving again. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And uh, Charlie Finley bought the team uh, just prior to that, prior to 64, and um, he really didn't spend money at all on players. So we, we were not those of us who were fans of, of baseball in general, but would like to have seen Kansas city be a good team. We're not at all encouraged about the way he was running the team. And then he finally got his wish and moved to Oakland and eventually started. Um, but I think what happened there was, you know, in 65, the, the player draft came in the June draft. And so Um, that kind of leveled out a lot of the talent that Kansas City was unable to sign uh, because now they could draft players who were theirs. And they used that draft very wisely, and he developed players who he then had to pay. And, I mean, he he fought. I remember Phil Garner telling me that when he was with Oakland – it was a bitter fight with Finley every year over the contract, getting any kind of a raise whatsoever. He was ridiculously tight with his money. But eventually, as you know, he was able to, to be one of the most successful teams around with those Oakland days of the 70s. Yeah. And then he just couldn't keep them when free agency came. So they went back downhill again. Sounds a little bit like us. Yes, it does. <laughs> So what what are your thoughts about, you know, talking about the opposite of uh, the ACE organization? 
What do you think about like last year with the Mets and then this year with the Dodgers? What do you think about like the imbalance of the power in the league? There should there's like a handful of good teams or a haves and have nots. Like, do you think they should there should be anything done about the spending? I would like to see a salary cap in baseball. Uh, there's really nobody calling for one right now. The owners are not pressing for one, but I think it certainly works in the NFL. And by works, what I mean is uh, it produces different winners. Um, it, you know, it's possible to rebuild a team pretty quickly with a salary cap. And uh, those teams that are the best teams uh, are not going to be able to uh, outspend the other teams in that fashion. But you know, the two sports are so different, Rob, as you're well aware. Uh, there's a lot of difference in the TV money, which is shared equally in the NFL and is not shared in baseball. The, the national TV money is shared equally in baseball, but not the local TV money. Mm -hmm. And teams like the Dodgers, who own their own network and the Mets and, and Yankees, uh, can just amass uh, millions and millions more to use on their payroll than the lesser light teams. So they expanded the playoffs recently, and that kind of gives – it. that's kind of like the small market team's World Series, right, just making it to the playoffs. That makes it, it more fun for the fans. Right, and I agree with it. Um, and, you know, everything these days seems to come down to money in sports, so um, there's more money for everybody when the playoffs are expanded. Um, I think the players certainly are having a heyday right now, and I think the owners – are having a heyday right now. So if you were to make a move with a salary cap, it would certainly create a whole different landscape. And and I think a lot of people don't want change right now. I think they're happy with the status quo. But nonetheless, I, I personally, I think if you had a salary cap, it would uh, make things extremely competitive. Um, but I think if you were to go in that direction, Rob, you'd have to also have a salary floor. So teams could not just take the revenue sharing money and make no effort to compete. I think, you know, there should be a, a level. I don't know whether it's 80 yeah. million or 100 million or whatever level they would set that teams must spend on their on their payroll. You know, and you could structure it that, well, if they can document uh, that they're spending this money on the minor leagues and, and signing uh, players they draft or sign from Cuba or wherever, that's acceptable, uh, but you know they, they need to spend the money, in other words, uh, on players. The players would never go for anything like that unless they had some kind of guarantee that the total revenues would be increasing. Yeah, they can actually do that now, right? Get a, have, a, have a floor. I mean, yeah, that's right, a floor. That, well, they, they don't have one that's on the books, shall we say. Um, yeah. So... Uh, you know, there there is revenue sharing. And so the, the teams like the Pirates, who are at the bottom of the barrel for revenue, uh, do get money from the top teams that goes into, into a pool. Uh, the bottom, you know, five teams or whatever it might be would share from that. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I don't think any fan of Pittsburgh or Oakland or any of the bottom feeding teams um, wants the idea of not having any hope that they're ever going to get any better. Yeah, and even if you look at the Astros, there's a lot of fans seeing seeing all these huge contracts go to other players, and are how come the Astros don't spend money? But they're like six hundred thousand dollars away from the the threshold, so they're spending money. They got a lot of expensive players on the roster, but yes. uh, I kind of derailed us here from talking about the book. Okay. That's okay. Um, well, you know, if if we want to talk about the book, of course, that was sixty years ago. <laughs> What, and what players were making then, there's a big... I think it's kind of fun to read the salaries and to read that the World Series share for the winning players was under $9,000 that year. So that kind of brings us back down to ground zero. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so on one of, the, uh, one of the chapters, you talked about Willie Mays. Mm -hmm. And it was something crazy, like he had 28 homers or something crazy. He had more more RBIs than games, and his home runs were close to the games played. I, yeah. I didn't. Re I mean, I knew Willie Mays was awesome, but the younger generation that don't really that doesn't really know a lot about him, they remember the catch behind, 
you know, mm-hmm. behind the – I guess he's turning backwards. I don't know how to say that. Over the but, shoulder. I mean, offensively, I mean, he's one of the players that have 500 home runs. But I read that, and I was like, wow, this – he's really good. Well, he was incredible. I, I think if you were to poll um, – the, the quote baseball experts who are old and have seen a lot of players from back even before 64. Um, and you know, there was nobody around now probably who saw Babe Ruth play, but nonetheless, uh, if, if you were to just try to, uh, poll people on who the best player of all time was, I think Babe Ruth for me would have to be number one and Willie Mays in the minds of many would be number two. So 1964, how old were you? 17. 17. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So way, way too young to see Babe Ruth play by far, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I didn't, uh, well, Ted Williams, yeah. um, you know, was, was playing. Um, He's one we, of the greats. Yeah. We didn't see, see many games on TV with Ted because the Red Sox weren't on television, but the Yankees were on television a lot. <laughs> so when you hear about how good these players are, you just read it in the newspaper or maybe you see it on the news. So there, some of them might be like mythological characters. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it, now we get to go to games. Those of us who are fortunate enough to, to live in big league cities or be close to big league cities and uh, watch all these games on TV. And, and uh, you can learn so much about a player's strengths and weaknesses from that. Uh, but that was not the case. You know, we, I remember waiting for that Sunday paper to come out uh, in the sixties and, and check the batting averages because uh, they would, all the players would be listed once a week. And that was it. That was how you found out what their batting averages were, unless you heard it on a broadcast. (laughs) Yeah. On Sunday, right? Yeah. 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 Whenever uh, Sunday, the Sunday paper would come out. I remember reading the box scores and then the standings and all that. Like I was, uh, like I was on TV or something. I remember (laughs) always having fun doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think that's the beauty of baseball is the, the everyday quality of it. And, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Bill White, 1964, uh, had a terrible first half of the season. He had 30 RBIs at at the all-star break. I think something like that. And, um, his shoulder had been bothering him. And he didn't say anything about it to anybody, but uh, then it got healthy. He had had an injection in the shoulder, but the doctor he went to had not hit the right spot. So he uh, found out about another doctor in New York when he was on a road trip, went to that doctor. That doctor gave him an injection into a different part of the shoulder, and immediately he started feeling better, and he wound up with an excellent, excellent season. But, um, you know, things like that were pretty well hidden back in those days. Now, you know, pretty much every injury that everybody has, uh, you know, with all the gambling in the game, the gamblers want to know, well, okay, what's wrong with this guy? How long is he going to be out? And so there gets to be a a need uh, for the flow of information. And it's not always accurate, but back in those days, it just wasn't a lot of flow of information. (laughs) So how did you keep up with the Cardinals back in 64? I listened to uh, the broadcast, Harry oh, Carey yeah. Buck on Camo X Radio, and, and then we had a local affiliate in our hometown that carried the Cardinal games also. So it wasn't Camo X, it was KDRO for us. And uh, they, were, they were on the air every day, and uh, that's the way we kept up. You have to use your imagination a little bit when you're. Well, you had, you had Harry Carey? We had Harry Carey. Wow. Yeah. You know. <laughs> wow. And that was, you know, the two Hall of Famers, uh, quite different in their broadcast styles. It was interesting for me as somebody who wanted to do what they did to listen to how different they were, because, you know, you, you ultimately needed to decide if you wanted to do that job, what kind of a broadcaster you wanted to be. Did you want to be more of the fan in the booth like Harry Carey, or did you want to be the reporter like Jack Buck? And I gravitated toward Jack Buck. Hmm. So keeping up with the Cardinals, who was your favorite player on the team? Well, of course, uh, Musial had retired after 63. So we all loved Stan Musial. Uh, but I, I like Kenny Boyer a lot. Uh, and Kenny was the, was the MVP that year in the National League. Um, 
certainly had a fabulous, fabulous year. But, um, you know, there were, I think a lot of people, of course, loved Bob Gibson. You know, Tim McCarver was a young catcher who really did well and, and so on down the line. Uh, there, there were a lot of attractive players for those of us who followed him every day. But I, I really like Kenny Boyer. Oh, yeah. Bob Gibson was really good. Gibson. From, from what I know of him. Yeah, and that uh, – that 64 year was not the best in his career. 68 was the year he won the ERA championship, and it was 1.12. Can you imagine anybody having that kind of an ERA? And uh, he was he was big on strikeouts, but he was just a huge competitor. And you know that that year in 64, there were so many good pitchers on the Cardinals. That's really why they won because of their depth. They had Ray Sadecki and they had. Kurt Simmons and Ernie Brolio, and um, they had Roger Craig, who had a very good year for them. Uh, but, you know, I, I think when you when you do a book like this and you follow a team's progress from beginning to end of the season, you realize how many changes they made along, you know, the baseball with a six-month season uh, and trades and injuries has a lot of player movement. And, and the Lou Brock trade in uh, June 15th, of 64 was the one biggest move that the Cardinals made that helped them to win. So they went out and got him. Yeah. They went and got him from the Cubs, the Cubs. I only remember him being a Cardinal. That's kind of, I I didn't even know that happened. Yeah. Because it was early in his career and the Cubs needed pitching. So the Cardinals traded Ernie Brolio for him. And Brock uh, was, was an interesting guy. He, he was a very raw player. He had tremendous power and unbelievable speed, but he hadn't put it all together. And the Cubs were, uh, they had this college of coaches in 62 and they were rotating uh, managers. They'd go to the minor leagues with a manager for a while and then they'd bring him up and he'd manage the Cubs for three weeks and they'd bring in somebody else from the minor leagues to manage the Cubs. And so he was getting all kinds of different advice. You know, one, one guy would tell him to bunt more. Another guy would tell him to uh, pull the ball. And, and so Brock's head was all tied up in knots. And when he got to the Cardinals, uh, Johnny Keene was the Cardinals fine manager. And he just said, Hey, look, we believe in you. You're going to play every day. You just decide what you want to do with stealing bases, with hitting. And uh, that's when the real talent came out in Lou Brock. Lou Brock was the, uh, the big time base dealer before Ricky Henderson came in. Yes. And, you know, it was interesting because Maury Wills uh, set that record in uh, 62. He, he stole uh, more bases than anybody ever had in a season. And uh, Lou Brock was able to, to pass him by. But Maury Wills and Lou Brock were totally different in the way they approached it. Maury Wills had nine years in the minor leagues. And he learned all these little things about how to get just a little bit longer lead and how to slide to get past a tag. And, and, you know, so even though he had stolen like 102 bases when he set the record, he was down to about 40 steals by 64. So the, the Dodgers weren't able to get the production out of him and he was older, but Brock spent one year in the minors. He wasn't a technique guy. He was just, you know, he didn't need that big lead. He could just fly. He, once he took off, he was flying. And he didn't need to be perfect like Wills did when he stole a base. And he just created all kinds of havoc. You want to talk a little bit about at the end of the season? Yeah. I know they can look it up. Right. Or read the books. I don't know if you want to talk about it. So, you know, yeah. One hand, if you do a book like this, you kind of hate to spoil it for the people who who didn't live through it. And on the other hand, you're saying, well, history is out there for them to look it up, so they're going to know what happened. But it was just the craziest month of September. If you, if you can imagine one team that had led for fifty some odd days, hitting a ten game losing streak with two weeks to go in the season, that that is just something that uh, I, rarely happens. Rarely happens. And then one of the other two teams wins nine in a row and the other team wins eight in a row. And so now you've got all these teams coming together at the very end. You get to the final weekend and it was just nuts. And that's why 
I really started looking into this because of that final weekend. But there was so much more to the year than that, you know, as you find out, well, okay, if this hadn't happened in July, then they wouldn't have had a final weekend to be alive in the pennant race, you know, th things like that. So, um, you know how football is. There, there are a lot of impactful uh, developments that come along during the season. Yeah. One thing that uh, I thought of is, like, I don't know if it was last year or the year, I think it was the year before, like the Yankees, they were, they had the best record in the American league. And then they, uh, they tinkered with their team and they made all these trades and then they yeah. went downhill. Sometimes you do too much. Well, you do. And, you know, I, I talked to, I was very, very happy to talk to Bobby Richardson. Um, and my gosh, you know, I mean, there aren't, all that many players still alive from 1964, you know that, but he's 88 now and he is still really sharp. And so in a 30 minute conversation, I promised him, even though he didn't, he didn't put any limit on it. I said, look, I know you do a lot of these interviews and you're so gracious with them. I'm not going to keep you longer than 30 minutes. So I really held it to 1964, but I've heard a podcast that a friend of mine did with him. And he talks about, you know, what happened in 1960 when they lost to the Pirates in Game 7 of the World Series. He talks about 62. He talked about uh, Madeline Maris and their home run record chase and all these other great aspects of his career. But but in 64, he told the, uh, the story of Phil Lins and the harmonica, which is in the book. I'm very interesting. And he felt that that brought the Yankees together. And I won't give that one away. Mm -hmm. uh, but he also talked about the fact that uh, – they thought they were done. I mean, the Yankees, they were at the end of an era here in 64. They didn't make the playoffs for, for years after 64. But they, they pulled it out. They, they put together a 22-6 and six finish in uh, September, and they were in third place early in September, and they came from behind to win the American League and then uh, fought the Cardinals to Game 7 in the World Series. So they, they really had – an excellent year. It didn't seem to a lot of people that they had because they were such a great team. You know, they always had unbelievable years, <laughs> but uh, he, he said that he saw it coming. He said they were getting older and they had made some bad trades and they had traded too many young players away. So he did see this coming. So what was it like for you as this lifelong St. Louis Cardinals fan? And then you go over and you're announcing for the Astros. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you know, you tell yourself, um, if you're going to go into this broadcasting game, uh, you'll work for any team. Oh, <laughs> and, yeah. And what you realize is, hey, even, even the worst team in baseball is good enough for me. Uh, I agree with you. In the beginning. And uh, so <laughs> I was really lucky because my first job was with the Cincinnati Reds, who were going to World Series at that time. And then, you know, um, bouncing around a little bit and, and getting out of baseball for a while. I didn't know I was ever going to have another shot. And then I came to the Astros and they had just gone to the NLCS against the Mets in 86. So they were a very fine team, too. And then, of course, you realize, hey, if you're lucky enough to be around um, through the years, you're going to have some rebuilding, usually. Oh, and, that, and, and, you know, honestly, I can tell you, Rob, Hey, in those years, like 91 with 97 losses, it was still a fun job. Now, we were not shocked. Like when I was with the Reds, um, they had had the best record in baseball in 81, which was a strike-shortened season. And in 82, they lost 101 games. They just cratered. Now, it's tough to go, I think, through a season like that as a broadcaster because you didn't expect it. You didn't see it coming. You know, they had had a really good year the year before, and then they were depending on some young guys who, who really couldn't deliver for them, and they cratered. And so as compared to a team that's rebuilding, not expected to do a lot, that's fine. You, you know it's coming, and you can deal with it. Yeah. Um, I started doing this podcast in 2018, and so they've the Astros have been good the entire time. So, not really uh, sure what it would feel like to cover a poor team, but I'm sure yeah. someday I will. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> Jim Crane is determined to to keep this team competitive and together. And even though it worked to uh, start at the bottom and rebuild the way he did when he took it over. 
I don't think you'll ever see him do that again. I would be shocked if he would accept that kind of a rebuilding program again. Yeah. They got so uh, let me ask you this, what do you think about the uh, Joe Espada hiring? I think it was the logical move to make. Um, he's been with the Astros for 6 years. He knows everybody in the organization. He's a very bright young coach. He's a fiery coach. I think that it was the logical move to make uh, and Dusty did a wonderful job. But uh, we all had a pretty good idea. This might have been his last year, even before last year started. And uh, so I think had they not hired Joe, they probably would have lost him to another team, another major league managing chance. And you hate to lose good people like him. So it's, it's his time now. Yeah, I think his name was going around before they hired Dusty. But I think Dusty was the right pick at that time. Yes. So I he's agree. actually worked for... Uh, two very good managers, two kind of different styles, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be good for them. Well, it's a good point you're making. I think that, um, you know, AJ was, uh, was fiery at times and he was laid back at times, but he was very upbeat. I think Dusty was more laid back certainly than AJ. And, and there was a huge age difference there too, but he had uh, tremendous credibility with his career and the players really gravitated toward him. And, you know, he, he was very friendly toward his players. He was not the authoritarian figure. Like if you read this book about 64, some of those managers were then. Uh, but it worked. You know, whatever works, uh, there's yeah. no template for it. And it worked for both of those guys. So the Astros 2023 season ended in game seven of the uh ALCS. I can't even remember how many times it's been. Seven or eight? Yeah. Seven. Um, seven. Yeah, seven in a row. Yeah. Seven. Okay, seven. seven row. Right. Yeah, they, hope, just hit. they just didn't hit, Rob. I don't think there was any real reason advanced that I read. Uh, the players were shaking their heads over their inability to hit yep. in the games. And uh, it's just very, very puzzling. Yeah, we only got production from the first four guys in the order, and I don't think Framber was on his game at all. I have to agree with you. I yeah, think I, even, I think he went zero for three. But so, but my point is this: like some people listening may think, you know, like the Astros had a down year or whatever, but they could blame Dusty, they can blame whatever. But they're one game away from going to the World Series, and if you watch the World Series, pretty sure the Astros would have handled the Diamondbacks. I would think so. That was a real mismatch there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, what was shocking to me was that you had these 100-win teams that didn't even advance past the first round of the playoffs last year. Yeah. You know, in Atlanta. And, you know, it, it was crazy that they didn't. Uh, yeah, the Dodgers won like 104 games, and now they're trying to buy everybody. Like, mm -hmm. they, really, they really want to win bad. Well, and I think that uh, Dave Roberts is certainly on the hot seat because <laughs> if he's managed to keep his job through all these years when they've really been disappointing, now what do you think the pressure will be on him? Yep. All right, so I don't want to take too much more of your time. We covered a lot of stuff, but uh, is there anything else you want to say about the book? Where the, no. When, when is it going to come out? Where can they get it? Oh, it's, a, it's out right now on Amazon. Oh that uh and i don't know when you're going to put this show on but tonight uh, okay tonight great well i have a free ebook uh promotion on amazon through thursday night you can get the kindle book free um and normally it's only $1.99 so it's not not that big a savings but i just uh -huh. do that promotion everybody and, loves free yeah and you can get uh, paperback or the or the hardcover whichever you want uh i think for people who really are into baseball history it's a good read for uh, what happened down the stretch there there there's some things that i never knew as a fan um because you know all these books have been written about 64 so there's just a wealth of information out there and what I tried to do, Rob, was was track all the contending teams and keep up with the biggest storylines that they had, so people would know, you know, kind of kind of like you're following along that season now, yeah. follow it in that in that sense. But in this book, you're following along with the season, what's going on in the world, and what's going on in the life of a young Bill Brown. 
Yeah, it was a, a challenge. I, you know, I kind of took a chance with that. I didn't want to do it that way, but Tal Smith was the editor and he convinced me, go ahead and do it in first person. So I took a shot at it. I hope people like it. I hope it's not a turnoff for them. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's a pretty cool idea, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so anyway, yeah, guys, get that free ebook till Thursday. Uh, for your Kindle, that's a Kindle reader, right? Mm -hmm. I see people re doing that at the airport. Yeah, I, I read it on my iPad, and it's not a problem, so you don't have to have a Kindle. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. This has been Astros Baseball. Uh, Bill Brown, I, I appreciate you coming on so much, sir. Always Thank a you. pleasure. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I don't need patience. I'll wait all night for you, sir. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Astros Baseball. And be sure to look out for the new book by Bill Brown, Baseball's Bizarre Season. Talks about 1964. Get it. Enjoy it. We'll see you next time on Astros Baseball.